Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod episode 38. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, my sidekick co-host of the Cube here for our weekly pod where we unpack all the latest trends, technology, hot takes, deep dives, breaking analysis, event coverage, all things enterprise and emerging tech. Obviously, AI is continuing to dominate. Dave, great to see you. Uh, and uh, we got hey, a John. ton to unpack. I'm in Seattle actually right now in uh, in the Westin. Oh, I thought you were in Denver. Just flew in from Denver this morning, finished supercomputing here to see Adam Selesky for the one-on-one -on -one pre reinvent exclusive. I uh, got an hour with him. I'll gonna pop and see Andy Jassy tonight. Check, check the hockey game out here. Nice. Who are they playing? Who are they playing? Who are playing the New York player? Islanders. So oh, nice. I'm looking, looking forward to that. two teams with the uh, not so good records under five, both under 500, but uh, should be great to see Andy. I haven't seen him in a while uh, since he took over the CEO jobs. It'd be great to connect. Um, but Dave, supercomputing in Denver. I was just there at the team. I was whole team coverage. You're in you were you're in Boston doing your breaking analysis. It was just, just covering Microsoft Ignite and checking all that out. It's AI everything. Dave, the, we're we're announcing today on the Cube that we're coming out with the Cube chip, the 2500 series. Everyone's got <laughs> chips, Dave. We might Is it ARM-based? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're gonna start a fab plant. Let's <laughs> well, billions of dollars. Were there people announcing chips? I, I didn't really I wasn't plugged into the news at Supercomputer. I was doing other stuff on a, watching it at night, but were there chips announced at Supercomputer? Well, everyone has chips. So we cover the CEO of Grok, which has a, a chip that does language processing LPU. They trademark that term. It does it does inferences at speeds, it's unbelievable. People got chips, a networking chip. Uh, you got Broadcom there pushing the new Ethernet speeds. Uh, open x86 architectures pce3 pci3 um e i mean sixth generation just a ton of chips around all the enterprise data center world so so uh, it's you know a what chip I wanna, game and, and microsoft announced <clears throat> two new chips maya and cobalt which are like um i, I guess maya, you maya call is an accelerator like, you and can then call cobalt, it like tranium inferential uh, tranium inferential and graviton they'll hate that comparison but here's my question john so th these are all ARM based, or most of them are ARM based mm -hmm. chips. Does does Amazon's lead? Because Amazon, I was just researching this because I want to put it in my uh, my breaking analysis. Amazon announced Graviton in 2018. I think they actually began shipping Inferentia in 2019, Tranium in 2021. So they got a big lead. But is that lead sustainable? Is it like no no compression algorithm per experience, or is there just so much innovation around these chip designs and you got TSM fab, although they're capacity limited, limited that you'll be able to compress that time to market advantage. Do you have a sense of that? You know, that's a great question. And my, my first initial response would be just from a traditional, you know, competitive standpoint trajectory is that they have a great lead and that lead's going to give them experience, as you said. However, um, the AI workloads are comp more complex than traditional workloads, especially traditional cloud workloads. I hate to even use that term. I mean, I think that's the first time I've ever said that the cloud is a traditional workload. Um, but we're seeing customers, you know, look at the complexity of the AI deployments right now, and they're different. And so I think that's the only wild card. I'm going to ask Adam Slesky that when I sit down with him around, you know, how their advances on the silicon would be. My guess is they're probably on top of it. Um, they do have an advantage. Um, the other thing that's going to be interesting that came out of supercomputing that will probably play into reInvent is the toughest challenges around networking, Dave, because speed yeah. is going to come in at the processor side. So do you optimize for GPU, CPUs, or TPUs, or some, do you want more compute and, and GPU processing power, or do you optimize for networking? This is a really big discussion. Now, I think that the general consensus on the bare metal data center, kind of like the supercomputing world of high performance computing, they want more GPUs because they can they can compete at scale with the hyperscalers. Amazon and Azure will probably want to get better with networking because they got the complex scale on their side. So it's an interesting perspective, depending on what view you're looking at that problem. So if you're it, the cloud, you got scale. If you're going to be coming up from the chip layer and building these next gen super clouds, which, we're, which are either tier two clouds, but have this super cloud power dynamic, you're going to come from the chip level and essentially create a white label cloud-like environment in a data center. And it's not just the traditional networking that we're talking about here. You're talking about the interconnectivity within the complex. So you got all these alternative processors, you got CPUs, you got GPUs, you got NPUs, you got accelerators, you have all, all these other supporting components, controllers, and they got to talk to each other. 
Yeah. Right. You used to Dell, all Dell. go through for decades. We've all gone through the the x86 and all the memory management. Everything went through the x86. That's getting completely blown away. So that internetworking becomes really important. That's why you know uh, Mellanox, the acquisition that Nvidia made, the Mellanox is so important with Infiniband. Of course, everybody's trying to shift the entire industry to to Ethernet because. You know, Jensen's gouging everybody because he has got the competitive advantage. Well, what's but, the, the the Ethernet's coming up to 400, 800, you know, gig, Dave. So like that's the, faster, right? It's getting faster. So this this is interesting. I was talking to the Broadcom people about this at the Dell um, um, sponsored uh, effort we had. And the Broadcom people were telling me that the e Ethernet ecosystem is democratizing the networking because the x86 standard and Chaz Trembley, uh, who was on the cube this morning? I couldn't do the interviews. I was on the plane to come to, to for the meetings with Amazon. What's saying on the cube directly? Their investment of multi years, many, many, many years of x86 ecosystem is going to not try to replace the GPU. It's going to be for the interconnect around it. So the question that came out of supercomputing was how, how two things came out of supercomputing 23. Can I get my hands on some GPUs? Number one, and everyone's fighting for that. And number two, how do I build around it with chips and interconnect and networking? So you're starting to see kind of like, like the old motherboards on a PC or a server. You got a processor and you got a bunch of stuff around it. The cloud scale is essentially like the same thing. So you've got an edge deployment that's going to be much different than, say, an on premise core uh, uh, deployment or a cloud native, cloud native public cloud. So if you're running cloud operations, then it should operate together but they're just different environments. So you're going to need standards to handle some of these plug and play components. And I think that's where x86 shines, not as a replacement for um, the GPU power. And InfiniBand is at risk because if Ethernet's a standard, then is that really providing the kind of benefits there? So that's going to well, be the big question. And everyone's like, oh yeah, InfiniBand is dead. InfiniBand is not dead. That's bullshit. Okay, I mean it's 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 under attack, but it's not dead. <laughs> no, I, mean, I know, but it's it's not as relevant. That's it's like saying Nvidia is dead. I mean, Nvidia well, is doing Ethernet well, too. It, it's a require. It's, it comes back down to the, the is it a requirement as a linchpin of a value? And I would speculate and say that networking, standard networking with Ethernet, that's going to be pushing higher and higher speeds. Obviously, that's Broadcom's agenda as an alternative, and this doesn't make InfiniBand that valuable. If the well, it definitely is... it definitely attacks Infiniband because Nvidia has got the market locked up. But but the, to me, the other key point though that you're making is that again, I go back to x86 used to have the monopoly on everything. They owned yeah. everything, they controlled everything, and that's changing. We're shifting from a, a CPU centric world to a connect centric world, yeah. and that interconnectivity is going to increasingly become important uh, for performance and cost and reliability and because you're moving all this data around internally um, yeah. and because you're seeing just the, the processor complexes are getting so incredibly complicated. <laughs> and so, so that's where I think that is Broadcom's play. Um, and then all these other alternative chips, I think what they're doing is they're customizing it for their purpose, you know, built at use case, which to me ties into the Gen AI power law. You're yeah, I mean, the, you're, the power law that you have that we have is matches exactly what's happening in the cloud scale. You have specialty clouds emerging, right? as we talk about with SuperCloud. And I had two people come on the cube and validate SuperCloud, and they said, you know, I now this one guy, he's like a legend. He worked at both. He worked at uh, Sun back in the old days, Renu Raman. He's seen multiple ways of innovation, um, and he goes, I finally realized what you guys meant by SuperCloud because he saw it at supercomputing. And that was is that you know as the chip. Do you integrate up from the chip level and create this kind of second tier, you know, bare metal, disaggregated memory fabric with LLMs as the abstraction layer, foundation models as the abstraction layer to essentially run all the infrastructure completely frictionless and transparent. So he's seeing this, we're seeing the second wave. And an example we use was Core Weaver company. It's in the yeah. weeds, but Core Weaver is basically enabled by by NVIDIA. Yeah, Nvidia. it's a it's a it's a it's a GPU cloud, right? It's I mean, a GPU it's cloud, but it's that's genius. The, that's the that's the that's the uh the, the the Nvidia cloud that they announced at their event that they didn't even mention AWS. So you know, Nvidia is playing both sides here because they're in in the clouds and they're 
in other areas. So, so, so they, they that, this was a big announcement at Ignite. Jensen was on stage. Jensen's everywhere, of course, but he's on stage at Microsoft Ignite. And he basically, they, they were emphasizing the size of these NVIDIA supercomputer clusters. I got my notes here. It's not Azure infrastructure. It's not this Azure Boost, which is like their Nitro. This is NVIDIA systems infrastructure. It's got a thin layer of Azure software to help open AI train and, and run their models. And, and, but, but basically uh, they're, yeah. they're outsourcing the infrastructure, the GPU infrastructure to NVIDIA. Dave, which NVIDIA is wrong, but but AWS was sort of fighting that, right? And Nvidia's, Amazon I mean, and, and Microsoft's embracing it. Do I have Nvidia, that right? And NVIDIA's DGX cloud, they're calling it, yes. enables a new market, the super cloud market, Dave. It's already happening. And this has came out of nowhere. It's like left field. So Core Weave is a great example. He's got 2.3 billion in debt financing from an asset management firms. And all they do is focus on the AI market in its, in its hardware. And they sell GPU-based virtual machines, which is perfectly suited for AI workloads. That's what they're doing. And they have other competitors like Paperspace, Lambda Labs, and a few others. But the specialism around that's working. Dell announced the AI server. Uh, Broadcom, again, standing right next, holding hands. They did, they made Dell. that public. I wasn't sure if that was public because I was just down there a couple of weeks ago. They, they, they whatever, if it's NDA, it's not anymore because they talked about it on theCUBE today. So so this new silicon, so I was bringing this up as the, as uh, on theCUBE as kind of this new, I didn't say is a cold war emerging, but you have the silicon players and the hardware players versus the cloud, okay? The battle for AI supremacy, which is the theme of SuperCloud 5, the, the week after Thanksgiving, during the week of reInvent, we're having that event in studio in Palo Alto, is an interesting kind of a Cold War dynamic because the suppliers of silicon have the hyperscalers as their customers, and the hyperscalers set the agenda because they have the scale and their buying power. They got financial leverage. However, though, the silicon players have great leverage too, in the sense that they're making a lot of money. So as the silicon players look at the clouds building their own silicon like AWS, there's, there's this emerging kind of game going on. So this tier two clouds, as we call them, super clouds are emerging. You got NVIDIA and the semiconductor companies have the scale and leverage to, to do a similar cloud with bare metal and some of these hosting providers like 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 uh, we're seeing emerge out of, S, out of the HPC world. So the HPC world could be bursting competitors in the marketplace with this fabulous concept, you know, of chips kind of going cloud fabulous, if you will. So like, <laughs> just like, you know, and this, if this explodes, then but aren't I correct? See. Wasn't wasn't Amazon sort of resisting Nvidia? Didn't Nvidia want to do this on the AWS cloud? And Amazon? I don't. Sort of I don't have it? any data. I don't have any data. I, I may that. be confused. I thought I thought somebody told me that 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 Nvidia wanted to do it, and then here we see Microsoft really embracing that. Um, I don't know. All, don't, all I know, all I know is that when Nvidia launched DGX Cloud and the and the and the um, Grace Hopper stuff, the killer next gen stuff, they did not mention. AWS, Azure was on stage, not AWS. So yeah, NVIDIA it's because I, Microsoft. I, I, I think it's because AWS was saying, "Nah, not in our cloud." You know, we're gonna we're we're the cloud, and so, so now so you rent, see all these rent. alternative clouds emerging. Now they don't have the AWS scale, but they got GPUs. So the the Renu could get him in the queue. I brought him on because he was he's been substacking this concept. He was in that generation like us. He's about our age. Remember the white boxes. Dave yeah, in the nineties, the ODMs, yeah, right. O ODMs. Why did they do that? Because they can build similar functionality, at no brand on it, and people were building large scale stuff, hosting environments, uh, and and whatnot, client server integration. Right, with, and that was a that was one of those your margin is my opportunity things. Yeah, ISPs were emerging at that time, if you remember. So his point is that movie's playing out again with the cloud, where these Nvidia DGX enabled market because they just leveraging their NVIDIA software and their cloud platform with that and using that bully pulpit of the GPU leverage and enabling this bare metal data center redefined concepts as clouds, specialty clouds. So your power law maps directly to where the AI market's going directly with specialty AI clouds. So, so and that's where the LLMs and the foundation models come in, Dave, because um, the speculation at, at supercomputing, will, which will probably come into reInvent, is that the foundation models will be the abstraction layer that feeds the interface of AI. If you look at the Microsoft announcements this week, everything's being repositioned as an interface change. Co oh, change for developers, co-pilots, Bing is Co-pilots everywhere. Co-pilots are going to be the interface 
through technology. So the if the interface has changed, what's feeding the interface? And what's coming out of this is that that abstraction layer is going to be the power law of the foundation models, which then also means you're going to need to have infrastructure, which is trained data and inference. And it was very clear coming out of HPC supercomputing event that even though training costs a lot, Dave, it's inferences where the value extraction is. So we had a conversation with the Grok CEO and we were saying, you know, training is like a sandbox. You got to do it. You spend money on it. You set it up. The inference happens over time. And the inference is the killer app because that's where the value extraction is. And that's where the iteration happens. That's where the AI gets better and more personable and making the users more productive. So you nailed this two pods ago and been banging the same drum. The productivity gains will be the outcome that will be part of this new application shift. If no one's productive with your app, it's dead, period. That's that's the new AI, right? If it's not making it productive, it's not going to last at all. Now, it so, could be productive under the covers. It could be productive in the stack. So the tech stack is merging. And this is where the Broadcoms and the Dells and the HPEs are going to win because they have their eyes on this HPC convergence with AI. And, and that's going to be create a whole new ecosystem. So, so you just you just threw out about the eight topics, but let me go back to what you're saying about the co-pilots and the interface. I got a quote from Satya um, at the at his keynote. He said, the way to think about this co-pilot, co-pilot will be the new UI that helps us gain access to the world's knowledge and your organization's knowledge. But most importantly, it's your agent that helps you act on that knowledge. So the reason why that's so important is because yeah. They're, they're talking about this Microsoft graph. So it's all your apps, all your services, and the infrastructure that supports them, okay? And so what they've done with this graph is they've made all those things coherent. So your co-pilot now has access to all that knowledge. There's a semantic layer that makes all those different elements coherent. And so that allows the co-pilot to actually act. It's a system of agency. And the reason why this is so important is because Microsoft has all this productivity software sitting on top of Azure and they're feeding it with compute, storage, networking, and platform as a service and database. And that's a massive flywheel for Microsoft because they have this captive business that feeds Azure. It's like feeding the beast. So this is huge and, and it's a new era. It's the co-pilot era that we're entering. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. And you nailed it when we were having that debate about productivity. Um, and so, you know, the interface is the is the new changeover. And by the way, Microsoft's trying to land grab that. And, and you know, I'll throw out an, a, a debate topic right now, but I think Microsoft is trying to stall, stall the AI momentum. They're trying to slow down AI. I what think Microsoft is quietly creating a campaign to slow down the momentum of AI. And you're going to laugh at that. So I know you're going to just throw up and- I need and, to, I need to- I need to think about it. Well, you know, based upon that news, they just said, you, you, if you look at their event, you're like, what are you talking about? They're, they're pumping right, AI exactly. all over the place. Right, so defend that statement. Okay, so here's my here's my conspiracy theory on this. Microsoft has a short-term advantage with AI right now. They have all the apps. Clearly. Okay, everything that they're doing is about Microsoft. Microsoft products, Teams, Copilot. They even changed Bing, the search engine that nobody uses, to... <laughs> Copilot. Why? Because Copilot is uh, the Copilot. It sounds cooler than Bing. <laughs> Bing has failed to adopt. Okay, so and they have applications they got install base. And our premise on the pod many times we've been saying this that the enterprise forget to put the consumers. That's part aside. The enterprise value is making AI to making your legacy stuff, your current stuff, better, and then creating net new advantages. That's the playbook that Microsoft needs to do to take advantage of the next next level because they can use their current base to get the momentum. And they are doing that. But what the best part about AI right now is that it's so good on coding that I could actually create an alternative to Microsoft's products the way they are now. On, as, but so if Microsoft can get through the, the, the chasm here, make this hurdle jump to PowerPoint, Word, basic products like Teams, their products aren't really good from an AI perspective but they're making them better now. But what's going to prevent an alternative to be created that, with AI? That is a hell of, that's a, wow, the way your mind works. So basically what you're saying is that all these co-pilots could potentially create an unintended consequence of making it so easy to create software that's that's competitive to Microsoft's estate. Yes. 
Microsoft's so, current estate is inimitable <laughs> as they add more AI to their shit. So that's that's a wild entry. theory. That's a wild theory. It's so I got to listen. Wild. It's so legit I, because I, Amazon I, doesn't have apps. So as as everyone goes into reinvent, they're going to judge re Amazon and say, "Hey, AWS, you're not as good as Microsoft." Wow. But on paper, Microsoft actually sucks right now. But but they're going to make their products more AI enabled, so wow. it's better. Well, hold on. Then that'll so that'll that'll create a barrier to entry for a startup to replicate an integrated co-pilot high data model and they fix azure they get azure up and running microsoft's executing a competitive strategy in my opinion that's pretty awesome and 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 if i'm microsoft i'm saying our current pre-ai products could all be replicated with ai within a year okay but but so wait so on paper microsoft's you know kicking ass yeah so, with announcements with copilot they're investing they're changing and just the their business product. performance their, their business performance is off the charts but so you got all these so here's the copilots, and I'm probably missing some. You got GitHub, which is for pro, the GitHub copilot, which is for, for professional developers. You got Studio, which is for end users. You got this power platform that's for citizen devs. You got the 365 copilot, which mm -hmm. is for end users. You got the search copilot. They got they renamed Bing. They they announced all these Azure Ops copilots, like security copilot. So they're just like pushing copilots everywhere. And because they have this data fabric, this data element that's coherent now, they are in a like really strong position. And to your point, AWS doesn't have that up the stack of, of software. So Google, who's got workspaces, and Microsoft, who have these productivity software capabilities, have an advantage because it's direct productivity hit. So it goes from, so developers, like you say, developing software, but then that's going to make everybody a developer and it's going to drive end user productivity. I would bet that Microsoft's going to get there because of its huge install base. People, it's just so easy for people to say, yeah, turn on our co-pilot for $30 per user yeah. per month. Well, I mean, they're, they're, they have an install base. It's just adding another charge. Everyone loves open AI and they put 10 billion and they're going to make a hundred billion on it, roughly more and more. And they're changing their products. My point is, Microsoft's incentive is to slow everybody else down while they change their product for the better and make it a little bit stickier, a little inimitable, so that's hard to copy, right? So that's you mean because me, they're because their products are they are they do suck. They're kind of, they suck in the sense that they're just too damn complicated. You try to, you know, the way you used to be able to just intuit Excel, you know, and even PowerPoint. There's just so many buttons. So if you can talk, if it, I mean. If it actually really works, which it seems to when I've seen it, if you can talk to the to the to the to the tool and have it do what you want it to do, that's super powerful. But you remember early, early AWS reInvent, you, Jerry Chen, and I were on the cube. And we asked Jerry, and we were riffing at the time, do you think Microsoft's going to go up stack? And Jerry said, you know, he was very articulate. He said, you know, I don't think so. I think their strategy is to enable developers to build applications that will compete with the with the SaaS vendors. Now, in many respects, Amazon's done that. They've got a lot of ISVs, but it certainly hasn't disrupted the sales forces and the service nows and the snowflakes and the mongos. I mean, they've become partners. Um, and in a way, I guess they are developing on AWS, but it certainly hasn't affected Microsoft. So the personal productivity piece seems to be the bastion of Microsoft and they've got a pretty strong mode. I mean, not even Google workspaces. I mean, we use it, but it's deficient when compared to, to Microsoft tools. I mean, G Google Sheets, it doesn't even add correctly. They get so many bugs in well, it. That's, that was your rant last week. I mean, but your point is, is that Microsoft has an advantage. And this is the this is why AI is interesting to me because they're recognizing probably in, in the smoky rooms that they talk strategy, that if they don't jump on AI and make their stuff kind of more aligned with the expectations for the interface as Satya is pointing out, which he's right. Every interface has changed. So the, the the thing about this wave is no matter what area you do, whether it's improving um, code assistance or learning, exploration, education, finance, every application expectation will have a, a new interface to it, a search-like interface, a personalization interface. Things will be personal. AI will make things better because the abstraction that's feeding that is data in the form of foundation models. And I think our power law research shows specifically, and what, what's interesting, Dave, is that coming out of supercomputing, the, the data center world's transforming because supercomputing HPC is now the new cloud-like capability for off-cloud, meaning data centers. So that 
distribution is following the power law of the models. So if you look at the specialty clouds, they're almost mapping to the, our power law on the foundation models. So that foundation models sense. create foundation clouds. And under the covers, you'll see like all kinds of hardware configurations, a GPU, this interconnects, faster networking, uh, glue layers, which will probably be coded by AI itself. Right. So, so this is like so, the mind blowing aspect of like the, the infrastructure. And, so, for, uh, so, so I was obviously not in the road this week for a change. And um, I was watching the Ignite, I've been watching the Ignite presentations, and so is Sarbjeet Johal, a Cube Collective friend, and and George Gilbert, the, the Cube uh, research analyst. And George made an interesting observation. He said he'd never seen a transition that where you've got this massive demand for software, sort of this accelerated software demand, and you have software that makes it easier to build software in the form of co-pilots. Yeah. And it's like you have this this double whammy that to your point, you know, could have the unintended consequence of disrupting Microsoft. I, I, well, that, I mean, his just... point is exactly what I'm, he's getting exactly the same kind of where I'm going with it, which is the demand's high and, and the coding is becoming the commodity. So if the products aren't going to be evolving, like Microsoft's doing a great job of trying to do that fast and you can see them. So they're incentive to slow them, the, the entrepreneurs down because they're going to maintain their position. So of course the big guys, we've been saying this on the cube with all this regulation bullshit, like they're going to try to slow down the entrepreneur side. So I think you're going to see that grow. Now here's the wild card in all this. I think it doesn't matter because one of the things that's that I'm observing Dave is the market's getting bigger. It's not a zero sum game. It's not like um, the, it's IT budgets fighting for each other. It's, trillions of dollars of new value okay and look if you look at the gpu spending okay throw away the sustainability problem that it has but if you look at the demand for gpus people are buying these things up like by the truckload if they can get their hands on them and and you know what they're doing they're not even thinking about their tco they're spending millions and millions of dollars on gpus just to get them and they're like wait i got them now what do i do with them so the next question is, what do you do with them? And that's the question people are like asking right now. Okay, I got some data. Do I do it in a, in a large language model and do inference? Or do I bring in small language models and have them interact with each other through APIs? This is the open book question that's not yet answered. So you're going to see a massive collision, this battle for AI supremacy that, that's going on right now absolutely is is has got high stakes. But the, the, the issue is it's not a zero-sum game. No one loses unless they don't have a good product. So the market's getting bigger money-wise. So I think that's going to make the entrepreneurial opportunity great. And that's what's coming out of all these cube conversations and these reports we're doing is that it's what we don't see that's going to happen. You know, how do you know what the next app's going to be if the interface has changed and whoever controls the model abstraction layer can create value? So, so Microsoft certainly will dominate on their high end an entrepreneur could come out and create something just as good, maybe. So that's so, that's kind of my angle on that. So you're going to ask, you, you won't get invited back, I guess, if you do, but are you going to ask Adam if his cloud is legacy? He might, <laughs> he might kick you out if you do that. No, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I might ask him that, you know, what I used that word earlier in the pod, I said traditional workloads. Um, I hear that a lot. I hear, you know, quantum conversations. I hear uh, with the AI when it's going to be in production with traditional workloads. And what I was saying earlier and what's coming out of these AI infrastructure conversations is the complexity required if, you, if you're taking a traditional approach, buying servers, loading RAM and memory in there, SSDs, you know, interconnect systems and putting that all together. If you don't have standards, it doesn't really work. So like it's complex. So do you run inference at scale? What do those clusters look like? How do you stand them up? So there's a big nerd conversation going on around that. So, so because it's complex, it's going to be hard to solve. So I think Amazon could be could be viewed as a traditional workload, traditional cloud. Um, that's the question I'm going to ask. Are you guys in the traditional cloud? Last year we talked about, I talked about, we talked about um, next gen cloud. And he's like, no, they're ISVs. Well, I think we took the cake on that one, Dave. I think we proved our point with super cloud that the ISV model, certainly with the AI trend coming is you're either an ISV building software apps with AI or you're a platform. So uh, AI is very platform system specific. Um, and I'm going to ask him that I'll ask him about his AI um, position perception wise. Does, do they think they're behind? 
And that's going to be an easy one. He'll probably reflect the, uh, you know, um, we're in the first three steps of a marathon. Oh, um, but I'm expecting an, um, an answer on that. But I'm not sure he's not going to well, be. Well, that's the narrative right now. I mean, that they're behind, that they're sort of legacy cloud. And I, I think, I, I don't know, John. I think, the we, we, look, I've said this a number of times. They've got the last word this year. And I'd be shocked if they don't put forth like a really impressive performance. I mean, in in July, they sort of cobbled together their little AI day to try to get keep some momentum. Hey, you know, kind of the we're relevant too. And and but the, they announced a bunch of stuff that was, you know, pre-announced. And so they've just GA'd bedrock. I gotta believe that it's just convenient for developers who are in AWS already. They just announced today tools. a new they announced that they just announced today. They're not a they're not, they're not doing press releases on these. They're releasing them all on, on LinkedIn. Matt Wood and Swami just posted introducing Party Rock, Amazon's new AI playground that lets you experiment, learn, and build apps with generative AI in in, in minutes. Powered by Bit Bedrock. Fitzy just dropped a post. This is classic Fitz. There's is nothing new here today, except he's he's moving to WordPress. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I love the guy, but that's like a, like, hey, I'm a dinosaur. I'm moving to WordPress. <laughs> <laughs> Which version? <laughs> you would improve platformonomics. That's, that's good. Uh, anyway, there's no, no fun stuff. Well, I don't, I don't get the joke. Why a WordPress? I don't know. He said, in addition to new design, I'm also moving to the WordPress mothership. <laughs> I've run this blog. Uh, I've run this blog using WordPress. Oh, so he's moving to WordPress.com. He's used some other hosting service. He's probably using Rackspace. <laughs> I don't know. I considered Substack, but that was too cool for me. No, I was, I was kidding. But WordPress can do everything Substack can. Well, I guess, but Substack's like a community, right? I guess WordPress.com is too, so... Uh, WordPress.com, it's not as strong as... Uh, no, God, right. Substack's like got all the momentum. Yeah, so. Substack's got... It's, it's really strong over WordPress. Oh. Um, he, must have, he must have had a deal in there. Yeah, maybe. Um, so what else? Who who impressed you at Supercompute? Were there any standouts? Uh, I mean, who was there? HP was there. Dell was there. Vast was there. Weka was there. Um, I was very impressed by... Um, yeah, Seamus over at Dell, um, Seamus Jones, he got me an invite. He recommended I go to the Dell uh, HPC community event. That was the day before it started, uh, Monday, uh, Monday afternoon. And it wasn't a Dell event. It was an industry event, but I think they were sponsoring it. And Armando went up there and gave a talk. And they had all these customers come in, Boeing, all the HPC legends up there. Talking about Intel was there. You had NVIDIA. It was a real multi-vendor, and it was a really good sharing environment. But they 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 laid out all the issues, and it was like a it was like a little bit of a like a the elite getting together right uh, out there and talking about it, and and it was awesome. And they and I learned a lot. I learned that the HPC. I mean, I knew a lot of the HPC community in general, but I didn't know what was, what, what was the mindset. They're on all the issues. It's like classic data center folks, but they're they're totally pumped because. This HPC community started when I graduated in college in 1998 from Northeastern, you know, young CS major. And when I worked at HP, they we did a little HP. Hewlett Packard was all over. They they made machine. They had they made hardware and chips. But this community with the AI wave coming in absolutely vindicates all the years of hard work and grinding that they've been doing. Because it's mostly been academic and big moonshot, large scale projects. You know, weather disasters evaluating oil spills, you know, big supercomputer things that were, you know, pre-cloud were just build big iron, right? And uh, with cloud, you got scale, that helped a lot. And now with this wave coming with the GPUs, you're starting to see you, HPC as a service. And the, the data governance models are going to be upside down. They discuss things like model management. How do you create reproducibility? What, what do you test? How do you measure model governance? vertical approaches so you know the, the theme there was that ai vindicates this computing paradigm at scale because that's the next gen level that the cloud takes everybody 
So the next gen cloud that's been going on for the past two, three years that we were reporting on now becomes high performance computing, but it's not just processors, it's GPUs, it's other chips. And so the semiconductors combined with software, now combined with this foundational model, AI, the generative AI, you now have a complete generational new era. Interface changed, abstraction layers are gonna change, how software is built is changing. AI hardware will dominate. AI will need more networking. And the hyperscalers are going to continue to dominate the trend because they're the customer of all the semiconductors. So you'll see Amazon, in my opinion, and Azure and Google be the leaders in, in how they design their stuff. So to your earlier question, I think Amazon will have a good lead with Graviton and, and, and their chips. Um, the question is, how do they integrate that into their stack? Because they don't have apps, except for call center, a few other things. Then that's going to come back down to their ecosystem. If Amazon can take their ecosystem today and enable their ecosystem to do what Microsoft's doing for itself, as we talked about, make Copilot in, in Word and Teams and, and all that Bing stuff, that's what they're, they're, they're AI infusing their products. If Amazon can take their entire ecosystem to their partner network and make everyone AI superstars or super clouds, they're going to win. That's a winning strategy because they're going to say, we're going to let the market create the apps faster and we'll let you, Microsoft, lean on your competitive strategy of owning the apps for the enterprise and let's see where it all falls. And like I said, no one loses because the market's growing. <laughs> and then you got the, the hyperscalers and you got these NVIDIA clouds that are like in these data centers and then the edge, it, Dave, it's just a monster market. It's not going to go down. I, and I guarantee you that the forecasts will change significantly. So my takeaway from supercomputing is HPC and AI is real. There's going to be an ecosystem of commercialization coming from it really fast because of the edge and on-premise needs. It'll run cloud operations, but everything will change in the tech stack to support the interface. And that's what's coming out of some of the conversations with Dell and Broadcom and others. And, uh, you know, dynamic infrastructure, you know, Fabrics, memory disaggregation. These are like nerd concepts that are like going to be scaling out. So well, it's a whole new ball game. The, distributed it's computing. Ultimate, that's the ultimate nerd fest. Right? Oh I God, mean, it was that's... incredible. It was very strong. Hardware matters. AI accelerators and chips and innovation. You know, you're going to have um, you know AI silicon platforms, silicon diversity, open connectivity. You know, things like how the APIs connect in, in the data in and out, how fast does it move? How fast is the chips? You know, those kinds of things is going to be the real conversation. And then the, the cloud guys are going to have to just make their stacks very strong and, and fast. Well, so it's a chip I mean, the war. action, the actions in the cloud right now, but then you got IBM and Oracle. Um, and then you got every ISV in the world, ISV slash data platform slash, you know, the Mongos, the Salesforce, the, the snowflakes, the Databricks, every one, every, the Intuit's name a software company. You can't name one that's not injecting AI into its into its platform. And then OpenAI just a couple of weeks ago, or when it was the last week, just made it much easier to do so. Yeah, I think I mean I, Microsoft's all in on AI, right? So what'll be very interesting to find out from Amazon on this trip is that, uh, and then reinvent is how all in are they, right? So, um, and does it did they are they even set up for it? Um, they're going to say yes, of course, but back to my point about being traditional workloads, when things, if the, if the new AI infrastructure emerges, and we said this, remember on two pods ago, we brought the, the concept of what if there's like a new kind of Linux model for AI or a new kind of AI system, a neural network, some AI infrastructure, call it new, some new thing that is architected with the piece parts of the traditional enterprise computing. What would it look like? It would have to support multiple data sets, real time interaction and do the generative thing that we're seeing. And I think that's going to be the question. Is there a new way and who moves over? And clearly Microsoft's clear in their event that they're going to the new way and they want to make everything and they're hiding the ball. Satya Nadella is saying developers, developer environment game has changed forever. Direct well, quote. So, I mean, let's see, let's, let's, let's talk about how Amazon in the cloud changed the world. See, I would say it changed IT, 
right? There was initially a lot of lift and shift. There certainly was, there were new greenfield applications, cloud native applications. It definitely changed. I mean, it completely changed IT, but how much did it change society, right? I mean, it definitely contributed. Things went faster, it was cheaper to do computing. So that obviously had an effect in society. You saw governments, you know, sort of push toward the cloud. Um, but yeah. when you think about the impact- I, mean, I think they have, I mean, if you look at the acceleration of SaaS apps, so if you if you consider the mobile generation, again, this is you and I discussed this. I'm on, I think I'm back, I don't know if I was against it or not, but I think mobile is a was an inflection point because yeah, of the that's format true. change, yep. right? So- and I data, think cloud, and, and definitely data, but it was all it was it was kind of under the covers. I guess, Does Airbnb is Airbnb a society change? Yeah, and yes. Uber, but yeah. uh, would that happen without the cloud? Probably not. Probably not. Twitter would have been. Twitter never would have happened. Twitter started in the cloud. Social media definitely changed. Okay, so so I, I I buy that, but but it it was really felt. I mean, yes, he felt it through society, but it really, really felt it was because of the IT enablement. IT was a blocker and Amazon removed that block. Yes. With, yes. with AI, what we're seeing with all these co-pilots is, is the system taking action for the users, the system of agency. And that's different. I mean, I... <laughs> I mean, well, George, it, George Gilbert and you had to talk a lot about system of record, system of intelligence. That stuff's relevant now more than ever, because if you have data, data and yeah. if the killer app is personalization and, you know, real time generative experiences based upon data and they're iterating through it, um, it's going to be incredible. So I think imagine having an interface. We was, I was talking to the CEO, um, Jonathan Ross from Grok, who has that killer inference chip called the LPU, Language Processing Unit, the speed is incredible. We were talking about how if you interact with an, a model after the third time, what if it made you better so that you were actually more creative in the third second in? The faster you can iterate through these, these in the initial prompts will change the learning trajectory or the, the productivity trajectory. And that's what he was pointing out. I'm like, wow, that's actually pretty right. Because think about that. What if it was so fast and so good where after two or three prompts, you were actually in a position where you felt comfortable and confident to actually do something. Whether that's a learning task, well, professional task kinda, versus being indifferent. Well, I'm not sure I can do that. Um, that's the kind of how, creativity, but, productivity that will it, rock with this kind of fast inference. That's kind of how chat GPT works, right? I mean, chat yeah, GPT gives still you slow though. I mean, think, yeah, think no, speed. No, but, yeah, but okay. But, but I'm just saying you, you, you prompt it and it's like, meh, and then you prompt it again, like, oh, that's a little bit better. And you prompt yeah. it again, you know, and then you're like, you'll pick out some ideas in there and say, okay, boom. And then yeah, that makes Dave, you better. Exactly my point, but it's but it's minutes in now. Imagine making that seconds, milliseconds. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And doing that in real time. Yes. You know, that's, I think, I that's why that. I like ChatGPT because they're actually, that's the format change. You no, know, yes. I had a guy in today who wrote this book, a restaurant in Jaffa, Mark Sorensen. He's an old friend, um, old, yeah. old EMC guy. Um, and he wrote this book. It's the first book he ever wrote. The thing is unfreaking believable. Um, it's a mix of like geopolitics with cybersecurity, with technology, because he's an engineer. So he knows, I mean, he was talking, you know, C++ and talking assembler and he's talking no op, you know, <laughs> all this sort of cool stuff, PDP 11s. And, and so you know, we took all through history and critical infrastructure and how uh, exposed this. Anyway, he said it took him five years to write this book. Right. And he just kind of wrote half, you know, a couple pages a day or not even page a day and then get back. He said 12 iterations. So do you think that, you know, like, there's no doubt, right? We're going to be compressing the time it takes to create art, music. Yeah, absolutely. Literature, mm -hmm. yes. plays, movies, scripts, right? Research notes, white yeah. papers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly this is again yeah, yeah, this, you, right? you know? <laughs> this is why i think the conversation around training and inference is going to get better and i think i'm now convinced and luis says from uh um from the cube alumni told me he, he was like everyone's going to go gaga over training but it's it's going to be inference right so that is going to be the, the big thing and i think what's clearly coming out of this is that um um 
um, the training is going to be the big language models. I mean, companies will have some sort of language model, some size, but that's like setting the setup. You train it and you kind of train it over time, but that's going to be the big upfront investment. The inference, Louis says it's from OctoML, by the way, for the folks listening. Um, his whole business is built on, on tra- uh, tra- um, inference. Inference is the value extraction, Dave. And that's what um, uh, the, the Grok CEO and I were talking about, that you get value as you iterate through the data. So inference, as you get bigger and better with AI, inference gets better. So to, and then, so we had nerd conversations on the cube, but we're talking about how, what's the infrastructure look like for that. And so training is like a, like a big setup cost. And then the scale out servers, the server clusters are all inference servers. So imagine having large language models parked at the edge of every device and the inference happens at the edge and you know, there's not a lot of data moving around. So you basically co-locate LLMs in areas you need them or foundation. I'm looking models. at a- I'm looking at a piece that Floyer and I wrote in April of 2021, breaking analysis, Moore's law is not dead and AI is ready to explode. And the point is, you know, Moore's law, like we know it is dead, but it's, it's actually accelerating because of AI. And that's exactly what happened. And then was, there's this chart that Floyer and I did, and we were, we were right, but we were wrong. It says as AI matures, inference will dominate. And then we had the percent of spending you know, today and in a 2030, and it just flips from, you know, 90, 10 to 10, 90, where all the actions in, in inference. And so I think the difference is we had it at 2030 and it's probably going to be more like yeah. 2026, you know, 2025, we have probably five years accelerated than what we thought, because that's where all the action is going to be in these domain specific models, you know, the power law of AI. Um, did you see any evidence that a couple things that a lot of this stuff is going to happen on prem, you know, we're not seeing a lot of spend yet. We're seeing downloads of llama two on prem, but not seeing any clear evidence yet. Did you see that at last week at supercompute of that? And the other part B is, did you see any camel humps along the long tail? Remember the the conversation no, we had no with i didn't Intel. it wasn't i think that i there was not a lot of data to observe on that other than hallway conversations the thing that uh that supercomputing that was most relevant was thinking about how the non-cloud operators are going to be building up their infrastructure in other words um the old data centers and the cloud service providers the hosting hosters from the old days um people with networking backgrounds they're doing great i mean we <laughs> i interviewed one Vul- uh, vulcan uh, was a company, amazing company. They're they're so successful. They're one of uh, NVIDIA's biggest customers. They're a cloud service, right? They specialize on GPU clouds. They're killing it. Their developer experience is great. The, the Their product's good. It's, it's less expensive. They're essentially an alternative to AWS, and that's what they say they are, and they are good at it, and they love it. And they're, they're, they were loud and proud about that. And so this whole show is about infrastructure scale, not so much um, AI models, but the, the what they were all doing was saying that those models will be foundation models will be an abstraction layer feeding the interface. So they're under that cover, right? So it's like, you know, interface, abstraction layer of models, and then infrastructure. Their conversations were like, how do I take a bare metal set of servers and create scale the, uh, in a new way that solves the AI complexity? And what's coming out of that is composability of these fabrics, disaggregating memory. So you have memory pools. So they're essentially re architecting the building blocks of traditional data center kind of thinking servers networks storage glue layers of middleware they're taking that construct and the chips that go in it and re- re- refactoring it to handle then, large scale they're basically bu- rebuilding clouds that aren't clouds they're like the edge or like a you know data center well and, there, mu- there must have too been a lot of talk about just sustainability energy consumption liquid cooling Right, yeah. that's that had to be a big topic of conversation. One of the things Microsoft showed, and they were making a big deal out of it, is that, that you know this is a liquid cooled chip, and we set it in a traditional rack so that we can retrofit existing data centers. And they were making a big deal out of that. I mean, everybody's going to do that. IBM is going to do it. You know, all the big, you know, computing manufacturers are going to do that. That's not like radical, but it is in the sense that it's going to allow these 
liquid cooled processors to be injected into existing data centers so they don't have to be completely retrofitted. So there's a, there's a nice bridge to accelerate AI injection because the demand is so high. I mean, I think, I mean, no, no one's talking about the sustainability problem, but it's it's a problem. I think that's going to be part of the the um, results here. There was some really good talk about sustainability, um, putting data centers into some different parts of the world. Um, they think latency is not going to be that big of a problem. They would rather focus on these more systems because the ex if you take the extension of the cloud concept and saying, what am I going to do on the edge? Or as satellites come in, we're expecting Amazon. I saw a tweet from Jassa today about satellites. It was started as a, a project at Amazon, a working backwards paper that someone wrote. It's now a product. It's about satellites. So the hyper edge or far edge conversation is going to be key. And it's a cultural shift that's happened. That's why the HPC event was big, because it wasn't the yesterday's mindset, but they all think in scale and exaflops, right? So they're like, they get the scale high performance computing. It's usually like the highest, highest end supercomputing. That's going to be table stakes, Dave. So the cultural shift is everyone wants a supercomputer, basically. You need that and you can get it. Yeah. And right. so that's going to be um, the chip war. Okay. So if Gen AI is part of everything. The chip's got to get better and the cloud's got to move up the stack. So, and you got to have so, an ecosystem. You got to have the security and privacy. The dev experience has got to be modern. The edge is the opportunity. I mean, it's it's complex right now. It's it's very very uh, weird in the sense of like there's so much going on for the cloud. So a guys. couple of things. So Microsoft and Nvidia, Jensen was on stage. They 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 like within three months we put together in the cloud using Nvidia, you know, uh, capabilities and Azure. We put the the uh, the world's fastest AI supercomputer and the number three supercomputer you know, on the, on the top, whatever, 100 list. So, you know how those things are constantly yeah. changing. I don't know if that got any joke, got any uh, mention, but he, they talked about energy. He said, in fact, in fact, today we're one of the largest buyers of renewable energy around the globe. This is Satya. We have sourced over 19 gigawatts of renewable energy since 2013. I mean, kind of a hero metric, but I mean, just to put that into perspective, it's the equivalent of the annual production of 10 Hoover dams. And we're working with producers to bring new energy from wind, solar, geothermal, and nuclear fusion as well. And then he said, I'm really excited to share that we're on track to meet our target of generating 100% of the energy we use in our data centers from zero carbon sources by 2025. Now, I'm not really an ESG expert, like, yeah. like Rob Strecce knows it well, like Carolina Melanance is all over this, but that's like not that far away. Now, maybe that's not a big deal because you can just choose where you're sourcing. I don't, I don't know if that's like phase three, that's not, but the power you know, phase problem three is a but, huge problem, power and energy. But yeah. yeah, these data center operators, I mean, they have no choice, but to, yeah. to attack this problem. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Amazon folks and, and uh, some questions around um, what I said with Adam and, and around the cultural shift around how data is going to work. Cause remember Amazon's got a lot of data and they have certain microservices, like kind of all kinds of services. I want to see if they're well positioned for it, but, but you asked me what was my big takeaway uh, from HPC. And I would say that it's not just HPC, it's HPC and all KubeCon, all the other events and our conversations that we are having here on the Cube pod and let's getting feedback from our audience, which by the way, thank you very much for the DMS and extra stuff is if it, it's not about just the chips, Dave. If, and so like to use the analogy, the chips are like the, the heart, right? It pumps things. And networking is like the bloodstream, right? If you got, you got to get networking right, you got to get the chips right, you got to get everything right in an operating system. So if the heart's got to be pumping, the blood's got to flow through the veins, that's networking. So why I like this Dell Broadcom relationship that we were talking about on the cube is Broadcom's working on the networking stuff. And we just talked about InfiniBand of the earlier. So I think it's going to be a combination of chips and networking. And if you look at networking, Amazon has an advantage with their cloud. So I'd be very curious to find out from Adam, does he want to optimize over the chips or the networking and getting it right, that, that balance. And if you get it wrong, you could be in the wrong side of history here. So um, he's going to say we're, we're investing in both. We'll right. See. And, I'm going to ask him that. I mean, the, the, I mean, you know, you know, you're a computer science guy. It, it's always about balance, right? And if you if you over rotate on one com component of the system, you create imbalance. So it's always that struggle to just, you know, not 
not have one part of the system create other bottlenecks that screw up the entire system, right? All right, well, Dave, I know it's late there and uh, I had to get into Seattle. Um, where yeah, I gotta go, I gotta do my breaking analysis. And uh, the, uh, the, poor, the guys are like, oh, really? <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate getting it in. Uh, well, I guess we'll have to skip the rant section. I guess my rant would be, um, we need more time to prep for reInvent. <laughs> my only rant, I was listening to Bloomberg today and I saw they were talking about the Microsoft chips and, and the Bloomberg um, host, she made a comment. She threw out ARM and she goes, yeah, these are ARM based. And I know ARM is behind technologically. And I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. they're not. <laughs> <laughs> you think Apple's behind technologically, really? With their oh yeah, no, the, the Apple Apple process, is also behind on AI and... too, right? Yeah. Well. Wow. All right, John. Cool. I gotta go. All right. Uh, let's wrap. Um, check us out. We're gonna be at reInvent. We're gonna have Super Cloud Five special going on on the week of AWS's annual user conference reInvent. Dave and I will be there with our team getting uh, editorial content at reInvent. Savannah Peterson will be in studio with our team where people will come in in, in Silicon Valley where we're going to have a live show called Battle for AI Supremacy, Super Cloud 5, Special Edition. We're going to have so much content. We're going to have people weighing in from our expert network, Cube alumni, friends, all focused on this evolution of the cloud with AI and how that's going to change everything. And we're going to, we're going to compare the clouds who's winning and who's not winning or who's slower. And we're going to break it all down with all the people in our community. We're going to unpack all the core issues. Of course, siliconangle.com is where all the content lands and all the video replays are on the cube.net and the cube AI is getting better every day. I'm loving that site. And that might just be our future site, Dave. <laughs> the the cube, so. the cube AI, the cube AI.com it's out of private beta. Yeah. Anybody can access it, go check it out. And um, yeah, I'd love your feedback. And then don't forget uh, Rob uh, Streche and Rebecca Knight are going to be in um, Barcelona. Barcelona at HPE Discover. Yep, yeah. yeah, great Which stuff. Big, big European show. So, and, uh, and I think our East Coast crew is high-fiving because they love going to Barcelona more than they like going to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. All right, that's a wrap. All right, thanks um, we'll you guys. We'll talk to you later. We'll see you, we'll see you at reInvent. All right.